Good morning, everyone. This has been such a strange morning. It's like there's all these, ever since the early service, all of these little glitches are happening like all over the place. But I, I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but I do think it can become a distraction. And the whole idea is, uh, let's hear what God wants us to hear this morning. You know, distraction or not, because everybody's doing their best. And uh, man, we're just, we're not all perfect, that's for sure, this guy included. Um, we're starting a new series today, which I'm really excited about, called Fixing the Code, How Misconceptions About Jesus Have Infected or Corrupted Our Faith. And this idea came to me this week, uh, really in the midst of actually dealing with computer code, which I'll tell you in a minute. But the idea that so many people have misunderstanding, misunderstandings about Jesus that they've just sort of picked up from different places, just kind of picked up and, and it's kind of gotten into their faith. And now they're discovering that, that they're putting their faith in the wrong version of Jesus and, and Jesus isn't doing it for them. So I think this is actually a really important series to see like, do I have some, some code that's maybe a little off and need to fix? We're going to be talking about that over the next four weeks. I'm going to start with a movie that really, a lot of you, you joke with me about, because I always speak in movies. And the movie that really got me to love movies, besides Star Wars, was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You remember this movie, 1969? I don't know why, I, lo- I was just, I loved this movie, even as a kid. And I remember the beginning of the movie always sticks with me, where, you know, they're running from the law, they put together this super posse. If you haven't seen it, you've got to find a way to stream this. Um, but this posse is chasing them, and they are doing all their tricks to evade the posse. And they're, they're going across rivers, and they're backtracking, and doing all the tricks that they know to lose the lawmen that are after them. And it doesn't work. They just keep on coming, and they start looking at each other, and they're going, who are those guys? And then finally, they get to a point in the high desert where they go over rock. You remember this scene? They're going all, and they, they ditch the horses. They run up over the rock, and they're like, you know, it's no use. They're not going to follow us now. And then they see the posse keeps coming. And they're like, who are those guys? I feel like in a similar way, this is how Jesus shows up in many of our lives, and especially people who are outside the walls of the church on a Sunday morning. And that is, just when I think I've forgotten about this Jesus person, he keeps coming up. I just found out another friend of mine goes to church. What's the matter with these people? Someone else invited me to the Christmas Eve, sir. Oh my goodness. What's going on? I keep hearing about Jesus and and it, it won't go away. I'm like, who is this guy? Who is this guy that everybody has put their faith in? That everybody seems to follow as if he cares about their everyday life. Why does it matter? Who is this guy? And so really in a lot of ways, this series is about discovering who is this guy? Who is this guy that just keeps coming? He just keeps showing up in our lives. Because there are certainly lots of different views about Jesus, ranging everywhere from, you know, he was sort of an ancient guru to a holy man to a teacher or maybe God himself. And I got the idea for code because I was messing with little code. Some of you who do computer code for a living, just please don't laugh at me. I'm not good at computer code. I just know a teeny amount. I was trying to fix something on a website. Here's here's the crux of what was going on. So I was trying to highlight text with green in the background. But, and so I had to, I put in this code, and some of you that know code, you're just going to laugh because you're going to see the mistake right away, but I didn't. So as I'm going through this code and figuring out how to do the background color and have the right hex code for the color and all of that, And then, you know, this, the sentence. And I'm like, what did I do wrong? It wasn't working. It was just giving me a blank. There was no highlight behind it. And this was driving me crazy. And I'm like, what? What did I do wrong? I did exactly like I'm supposed to. And then I went online and saw the source code. I like typed down, like, what is it really supposed to be? And I'm like, oh, shoot. I forgot a back, a forward slash. That's it. One forward slash. And the whole thing didn't work. And then uh, another time I had tried it in and, I, and I, I put it in and it came out with like a red background. 
I'm like, what did I, what did I do wrong there? I said, look, I, I've, got the, I've got the forward slash. That's all right. Oh, wait, no, I had the wrong hex code for the color. Oh, okay, okay. And then when I got to the next one, or yeah, that was the hex code, go on to the next one, next slide, is this is what it was supposed to look like. And when I pulled this up and saw exactly what it's supposed to look like, it made it a lot easier to find the mistakes. It's so much easier to spot the errors when you see the original, when you see the source code. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the source code of Jesus. That is that first version of Jesus that his very first followers followed to see if maybe what we believe about Jesus has been a little corrupted. Maybe we've accidentally skipped a forward slash and it makes the whole thing not work. And this is just simple code, right? Imagine this complicated code. It is so much easier if you have a source code to work with to spot where all the mistakes are. So that's what we're going for in this about Jesus Christ. It's so much easier to spot the errors when you can see the original. So we're going to take a look over the next four weeks at the original. And here's what's at stake. If you build your life, if you build your faith on faulty code, it's not going to work. Here's what I mean. Um, when I was doing youth ministry, gosh, forever ago, outside of Philadelphia, there was a, a kid in the youth group who he was one of my favorites, middle school kid, who really had turned a corner in his faith in Jesus. And his dad contacted me. He's like, I need to talk to you. I'm like, okay. And we talked about my son. Okay. So he comes in and he's, he's talking to me about, my son, uh, about his son. And he's like, uh, listen, my son really has gotten into Jesus lately. And he wasn't happy about it. And I'm like, oh, you should be thanking me. I didn't say that, but I'm like, <laughs> he's gotten really into Jesus. And he was, he really was trying, even as a middle school kid, to live out his faith. It was really amazing to watch him. He ended up going into ministry, which is really cool. So it all worked out. But his dad wasn't happy at the time. And he said, he needs to focus on his future. Will you tell him he needs to spend more time on his homework and not so much church stuff? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what do I say to this dad? Like, uh, no. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll tell him to do his homework. But he really was trying to live his faith. And then his dad says something to me that really was telling. He said, it's not like Jesus micromanages our lives. Like, he doesn't care about what happens in our daily life or anything. Like, I feel like that's sort of silly. And he's like, right? I'm like, well, you know, I, I, I said something really non, uh, very neutral. Because I didn't think, I was just a youth pastor. I wasn't even a pastor. I felt like I don't want to correct this dad's theology. I don't think that would go very well. And I just said, well, you know, I could see how you could see it that way. Or something like that, right? But it was very telling. He had an error in the code that made him think that God didn't care about his normal everyday life. And it changed his behavior. It's like when I was working at the summer camp, I just learned guitar. And uh, my, my freshman year of college, I learned guitar. And somebody needed to sing for the camp band or whatever. And, and the camp director was like, you know, why don't you give it a try, Jason? I'm like, okay, you want to give it a try. And so I sang and played guitar and led worship, and I, I wasn't very good because I had never done that before. I was super nervous, so I was kind of quiet. And the director afterwards, he goes, yeah, you know, you just, you don't really have a upfront voice. You have more of like a behind the scenes voice. And he said, you sound good. You're just not, you know, you're too quiet. You're not really good at leading. What's funny is, so some of you know my story, know that I made a living doing that years later in um, basically Christian music, going around and doing what Dan does, worship leading and stuff. But I held on to that belief for a really long time, where even when there were opportunities where I felt like God needed somebody to step up, I wouldn't step up because I believed I don't have that kind of voice. When you believe in Jesus 
and the code's not right, it comes out in your behavior. This is what I think's at stake. Allow me to mix metaphors for a minute. It's like barnacles on a boat. It's all this Jesus and. Like I have Jesus, but then I like all these other things. And, I, and I, they just sort of become barnacles on the boat. After a while, I don't know much about barnacles. I just know they clog everything up and they're bad. Like the boat will stop working. It will rust. It's not good. And I think this is sometimes what could happen in our faith if we don't pay attention to the code. So if we can get a clearer picture of the original code, the version Jesus' very first followers knew, I think we can fix the errors. So there's the premise. We're going to jump in today with a story that I referenced last week, and I thought, let me tell that whole story. I think it really says something about the source code of Jesus. Here we go. This is Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So even as we're thinking about how is Jesus different, this story is going to tell you a lot of different things about why Jesus was different than anyone else of his time and anyone else that we would ever know. So first of all, he was famous. We know that. We got a lot of famous people, right? But we know he was famous enough that people were coming to hear him from all over. And it's not like today we could just sort of, you know, put on the TV or put on a streaming service and hear Jesus. Like you had to like walk and travel and go here. It's sort of remarkable that he had the following that he did so early. Then some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. So what are they expecting? They expect that Jesus not only is a famous teacher, he's going to do something about it. He is a healer. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Last week we talked a touch on this a little bit that Jesus already sort of knows what they're going to say. Like, oh yeah, anyone could walk in here and say your sins are forgiven, but I don't know that it's true. Anybody could say that. Well, watch how Jesus addresses that. It says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, and here it comes. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit. So there's something. He knew, he perceived exactly what they were thinking. That this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this as if the crowd were saying who is this guy so who is he how do we know who jesus is well we certainly know through the new testament who jesus is said to be so according to the new testament he's the messiah the promised one from the beginning here to save us from sin and death to make all things right, to bring in the kingdom of God. He's the son of God. What else does the New Testament say? That he has the authority to forgive sins, as we just saw, which is the authority believed only God had. So the claim is he is God. He performed miracles. He healed people. He was crucified, died, and buried, and he rose again. We all know this. This is Christianity 101. And here comes our first faulty code. And that is this. Well, Christians believe the New Testament, but there is no evidence outside of the New Testament that Jesus was God, that his followers thought he was God, or that Jesus even existed. 
I found myself not on TikTok, but I saw a TikTok video, okay? So just calm down. Calm down. <laughs> I don't even know how I came across it. I was some other platform, and I'm doing the thing where I'm scrolling mindlessly for God knows how long. And I come across this TikTok video of this guy who apparently his entire mission is to debunk Christianity. And I'll just say, he's not very good at it. He started and he's like, how, what a stupid thing of God to do if God's real at all. Because there is no evidence outside of just a few followers that Jesus ever claimed to be God or that Jesus ever lived and died or rose again or anything like that. And, and I'm thinking about this. I'm like, oh my gosh, people are watching these videos and they might not know better. They might not know and they might think, oh yeah, you're right. That is crazy. That's faulty code number one. Faulty code number two goes kind of hand in hand with it. And that's this. Jesus' divinity wasn't even decided until the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. So if he died and rose again in, in the year 33 approximately, that'd be some 300 years later. In other words, nobody thought he was God until later at the Council of Nicaea. And actually that comes from the Da Vinci Code. That was really popular when that came out. And I remember people were freaking out and like, Jason, do you know, like, is that true? I'm like, I'm just a youth pastor, dude. I have no idea. Like, don't want to ask me. People are freaking out about their faith. Well, if that's true, that puts a lot of things into question. These are two faulty codes that I want to start with today. Let's start with the first, that there were nothing outside the New Testament. I mean, which is patently false. I'm just going to give you a few, few thoughts here. The first, the Apostle Paul wrote his New Testament letters within about 17-ish years, from the year 50 to the year 67. So again, the resurrections in year 33 were pretty close to the resurrection event where people would know if he was lying. Here's what I mean. Think about in the last 20 years, now it's longer than that, but think about the last 20 years, some big event that everybody knew about that they wouldn't forget. So think about 9-11. If somebody came out and they came on TikTok or whatever, they, and they came out and they said, actually, there were no planes that hit the towers. They just fell. Nobody would let that fly because everybody remembers it. Everybody saw it. Everybody experienced it. You couldn't lie about that because you saw it with your own eyes. Same thing here. You couldn't just make up Jesus and expect people to listen. They all knew it. They were all within the lifetime of Jesus. You couldn't just come up and say completely false things that made no sense. Everyone would be like, oh yeah. Right? No, they'd, they'd point that out immediately. So I think that is something to consider as he wrote his letters. Now, here's a few non-Christians outside the New Testament that verify what the New Testament claims. The first is a historian. His name is Flavius Josephus. He was no friend to Christians, I'll tell you that. And in the year, around the year 94, he wrote his history called Antiquities, where he was uh, the history of Rome. And he recounts the unlawful execution of James, the brother of, quote, Jesus, who was called Messiah, unquote. So clearly, from the beginning, from a non-Christian point of view, they knew they were calling him Messiah from the beginning. That didn't happen in 325. Let's keep going. Tacitus. He wrote the Annals of Imperial Rome. He was another historian. This was written about 116 AD, and he wrote specifically on the time period where Jesus was, from about the year 14 to 68. Remember, if he died in around 33, it's right in that time frame of Jesus and the early church. And as he writes, and anybody can pick this book up, it's not terribly exciting, but if you could read it, he wrote about the burning of Rome in 64 AD and Nero's persecution of Christians. The Christians were blamed for the burning of Rome, uh, falsely. And confirmed their faith in Christ and in his execution at the hand of Pilate. That's why in the Apostles' Creed we have, you know, suffered under Pontius Pilate. It seems like a weird thing to put in a faith statement of a Roman governor's in the statement. It's because it's historical. There has never been, you've heard me say this before, there's never been a single piece of archaeological evidence that has contradicted the history of the Bible. Not one. Not one ever. 
Interesting. Let's look at this. This is my favorite name, Pliny the Younger. We should go back to names like this. I would like to be the Jason the little bit younger. Jason the younger than you think he is. Something, all right? Let's give myself a title. Anyway, he wrote a letter to the emperor at the time, Emperor Trajan, in, again in 113 AD. And, and a lot of these are written all around the same time. Why? Because Christianity had time to form in those few decades, right? I mean, so it makes sense. You wouldn't write about it as it's happening because it hasn't happened yet. So he writes a letter and he talked about Christians singing hymns to Jesus as if he were a god. Again, let me give you one more. And this, is, this one's kind of cool because he was a philosopher, Aristides, who he wrote a letter to Hadrian, the emperor, in 125. He actually was a philosopher that then converted to a Jesus follower. Here's what he said. The Christians then trace the beginning of their religion from Jesus the Messiah, and he is named the Son of God Most High. And it is said that God came down from heaven and from a Hebrew virgin, assumed and clothed himself with flesh. And the Son of God lived in a daughter of man. This is taught in the gospel, as it is called, which a short time was preached among them. And you also, if you will read therein, may perceive the power which belongs to it. This Jesus then was born of the race of the Hebrews, and he had 12 disciples in order that the purpose of his incarnation might in time be accomplished. But he himself was pierced by the Jews, and he died and was buried, and they say that after three days he rose and ascended to heaven. That's basically the Apostles' Creed all the way back way earlier than 325 at the Council of Nicaea, and very fully formed. So you could believe that followers of Jesus, this is what they thought, and this is all confirmed outside of the New Testament, not just in the New Testament. So fixing error code number one, there is evidence outside the New Testament. And we can actually go back further than the 100s. This is really kind of amazing. What did, what's the source code? What did the very first followers of Jesus believe about Jesus? We can actually get really, really close. So in Paul's letter to the Philippians, again, written between 49, 51, let's call it 50. And if you, if you open your Bible, you may want to do this. If you, some of you bring your Bible, you may want to open your Bible to Philippians chapter 2, or you have your pew Bible in front of you. What you'll notice is this part, this is actually uh, from the Greek New Testament. But this part, chapter 2, when verse 6 starts, everything's indented. Everything's indented from verses 6 to 11. Why? Why is it indented? And it'll be in your English translation. It'll be indented. Because it's a quote. He's quoting something that already existed before he wrote his letter to the Ephesians. Which means, whatever it was he quoted was well known prior to the year 50. This gets us, perhaps, at the very earliest picture of what the first followers of Jesus believed. So in other words, if the crucifixion is 33 and Philippians is 49 or 50, this is somewhere between the two. And verse 5 sets it up. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And here it comes. Here's the quote. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some translations, every tongue confess, which I actually like a little bit better. That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is very, very clear that fixing code number two, Jesus' divinity was established from the beginning. The same TikTok guy. I gotta find out who this is. But I don't wanna like get on TikTok and try to respond. I just don't wanna do that all. But 
He's like, well, what's the evidence of the disciples? I said, here's the evidence. They all died as martyrs believing exactly this. All of them. And Peter famously choosing to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel himself worthy to die in the way of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but at some point when they're getting ready to put me on the cross, I'd say, okay, time out. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Listen, Peter made it up. He really wasn't God. We were just trying to do a thing. They believed it to their end. Again, if we get a clearer picture of the original code, the version his very first followers knew, we can fix the errors and build our lives upon the real Jesus. Because I, ha- I think it happens innocently, but we just, again, it's, we add stuff to the code. I was talking to a Christian friend of mine, and you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but uh, he, he told me, he's like, yeah, you know, the universe was just telling me. And again, I want to offend anybody, but that sounds, why, what do you, the universe, the universe, the expanding, the physical universe told you something? What does that even mean? I don't even know what that means. But I think it just sort of happens accidentally. You just kind of rub up against maybe some code that doesn't make a lot of sense. And maybe you like how it sounds and it just kind of gets added to So who is Jesus to you? That's the real question, isn't it? Who is Jesus to you? Is he a guru, holy man, great teacher, or C.S. Lewis, the trilemma, liar, lunatic, Lord, Savior, God? This is important. If there's something to build your life on, I'm a little biased. I believe it to be Jesus Christ. Because I believe he he is the real thing. In a world full of counterfeits, we go chasing after all sorts of counterfeits. And you know how FBI agents discover counterfeits? Of course you do. They don't study all the possible counterfeits. They couldn't possibly study enough things. They study the original. So they know it so well, they spot a fake anywhere. When we know the source code of Jesus Christ, we can spot a fake anywhere. And what's at stake here? Let me just close with this, and then we're starting to run out of time. I had this experience today in a local market, or not today, this week, in a local market where there were two young people. One was in line, uh, both kind of in their young, uh, early 20s, uh, young woman and young man behind the counter. The woman starts talking to the man behind the counter and she goes to show him a picture, says, oh yeah, this is some work that I did over at first whatever church. And he takes a look at the picture and is like, oh, this is really good, but it gives me PTSD, as if to say about church. And she goes, i never been to church in my life, so I wouldn't know. The conversation ended. They both kind of went their ways. And it made me really sad and also kind of on fire to to know the real Jesus and make him known. That people either have so much baggage with Jesus that it's stopping them because of bad experiences with Christians. Some of that is earned. Or people just don't know. They were never brought to church. They don't know that Jesus is the answer that they've been looking for. Let's study the code so well that we make him known, that we know him and make him known everywhere. Amen.